That's why I said heart. The heart <laughs> to work with children. It will be on Tuesday evenings. Um, so if you're available and willing to help, please let us know. Also, we're going to have a small, uh, hopefully not small, but a short meeting next Sunday after the service. Talk about outreach. How we can be out and about in the communities, being the hands and feet of Jesus. So if anybody wants to come, it's going to be a brainstorming. What can we do to put uh, practice what we preach and get out there? So come and uh, throw in your two cents and offer up some opinions and we'll just brainstorm. So that's next Sunday after the service.
everybody loves us. Just let him take it for a minute. Stop trying to figure it all out. And just know that he's got it. And those verses he kept talking about, um, he never slumbers. And uh, there were times I was so tired. And I was like, well, I got no sleep yesterday. Two hours was awesome last night. And uh, I realized the third night I needed to get some sleep. But I was very reassured by my Savior that he wasn't going to take a moment's rest. And uh, that's, that's with any battle, not just mine. You know, he's, uh, he's not a guy that closes our eyes to our suffering. He's not a guy who closes his eyes to Iran. We see these big battles. He's got bowls and he's got the little ones that seem big to you. You know? Um, and this song is, Be still my soul. In you I rest. And as you're saying, as you're worshiping the Lord, own that. I'm going to rest in you this week. I'm going to rest in you right now. Those worries that I brought in with me, I'm going to give them to you. And just be still. Amen.
It's that time of the year again. We'll get through it though. Now, don't be waiting. Put your arms up. Hold this here. Okay. So this is a box. We're going to be talking about God and having the correct perspective on God. And some of this stuff you may have heard before, but I think it's important to reiterate and uh, get that proper perspective. So, as we're going forward into the new year, I want to make sure that we are looking through a correct lens of who God is, because what we think of God dictates how we live our lives in accordance with that. So, this is the box here. So, we're going to keep you from putting God in a box. If you have him in the box already, we want you to get him out of the box, because we're talking about God who is unmeasurable and limitless and go on and go on, so you can't obviously put it in a box. But a lot of people do, and we're going to unpack that a little today, and uh, maybe we'll destroy the box at the end, so we can go back to it. Thank you. Let's go to the throne. Father, uh, let's help us to feed on your word so that we can be people that honor and glorify you in our everyday walk, Lord. Uh, speak to me, and let the words come out, be of you, and uh, just increase our knowledge and love. Uh, which is the most important, so we can display your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, before we start, I want to read from Revelation chapter 4. And I'm going to start in verse 1. So, this is going to give you a little glimpse. God's pe peeling the curtain back here, and, and you're getting a glimpse of the throne. So, here's the Apostle John, who is in the Spirit, he says. So, he's in heaven, in the Spirit. And he says in verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and there was a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of jasper and carlinian stone, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders, dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back were around the throne on each side. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. So these four creatures, that is what they do. Non-stop proclaiming the holiness of God. Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. So that line right there, who was, who is, who is to come, they're talking about the infinity of God, the ever-existence of God. Do you know there was a time that you weren't? But there'll never be a time where you're not. Now that you're born, there'll never be a time where you don't exist. There was a time when you didn't exist. But now, you will never have a time. You will always be from now on. And you have this small... Uh, the Bible calls it a vapor. This quick time that we're in the flesh on this planet to decide where we're going to spend the rest of eternity. So we need to know if we're going to spend the rest of eternity, do we want to spend it with the Almighty Creator or do we want to be separated from Him? Those are the kind of the choices that God lays before us. Life and death, blessing and curse, salvation through Jesus Christ or condemnation apart from Jesus Christ. So we need to have a, a correct view of God. And here, that, look what that says. Holy, holy, holy. They're telling you right there. Now, if they repeat something, it's very important. If they repeat it again and again, it's very, very important. God's holy. He is almighty. That means he has all power. So this is who you want to serve. This is who you want to plug into. The one with all power. The one who has always been and is from everlasting. The one who is holy, without stain, blemish, perfection. So this is a quote from A.W. Tozer, who was a great Christian mind uh, of uh, 
last century. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So, there's a lot of people who have the wrong perspective of God. There's people who think that God is a genie in a bottle, that they can go to him when times are bad and, and be blessed. Okay? That's not God. So they're following a wrong God. There's people that think that God uh, is just love, and he accepts everybody, and he doesn't care about uh, sin because we're all sinners, and at the end of the day, God is love, and that trumps everything. That's also a lie. That's a half-truth, which is a full lie. Because God is love, but he's also a God of justice and wrath and righteousness. Okay? So you got to have a proper perspective of God. And then there's people like my professor. Uh, she was tormented as a child and had a really bad upbringing. And uh, their whole family was, was like terrorized by the dad, the father. And she never wanted anything to do with God. Because she looked at God, she knew the Bible said... No, he's a father. And God's portrayed in, in uh, male pronouns. And he has a son named Jesus Christ. And she looked at God as a father and looked at her earthly father and said, God's going to be just like this. A, a, a tyrannical ruler who torments us, who abuses us. God doesn't have my best interests in mind. So she never wanted anything to do with God because her father was a bad example. And she looked at dad and says, Father, Father, I don't think so. So she had a bad and wrong perspective of God. So she thought God was out to get her. She thought she messed up too many times. And there's, I see this all the time with people. I remember talking to a guy and he says, well, I know I'm going to hell. That's a done deal. No, 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 no. That might be right. You might currently be going to hell because you're outside of salvation through Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that's a done deal. That doesn't mean you're thrown away and reprobate and unable to give your life to Christ or I've done too much in my life where God can't forgive me. That's another lie and a wrong perspective of God. He wants all that you have, trash, and what you consider good things because guess what? At the end of the day, it's all rubbish in the eyes of God, what we can bring to Him. We're just vile sinners. He just wants us to come unabandoned to Him or abandoned. So she had that, that, that misconception that God is angry and out to get me and doesn't have my best interest. Until she read John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world that he saved his one and only begotten Son. He gave his Son. But that part right there, for God so loved the world, she said, Ha ha! I got God! I got him on a technicality. It says here, For God so loved the world. And she goes, Well, I'm in the world. That means God has to love me. And she goes, where? There it is. I was wrong all along. And she looked at that and says, okay, this is the Bible. It says he loved those in the world, and that's me. So then she started getting more into understanding God, saying, okay, I'm in the world. I'm going to grab that love. I'm going to take him on his word and go with it. And now she has a long walk. She's uh, uh, probably in her 70s now, and she's been walking with the Lord for many, many decades. But she tells that story of her perspective was so skewed. And she was living her life according to that. So if you live your life that God, uh, you think it's too late for you, and God's already written you off, then you're not living and walking in the correct perspective of God. God will come to you, and he will forgive you at any time in your life. It's never too late. So, what do we need to learn about God? We need to learn that he's sovereign. That he is the one who reigns. Okay? Reign means uh, like a kingdom, a ruler, kingship. So we got, uh, there's no mayor like this, is there? So let's see Bucyrus. Bucyrus is a mayor, right? So he reigns over that city, right? And then uh, the mayor or governor of Ohio, a governor reigns over that state. And then who reigns over the world? It says, uh, well, the country, the Trump's over this country, the president's over our country. So those people reign over that. And the Bible says that the devil is, the Satan is the God of this world. So Satan has reigned over this world. But it says that Christ, that God Almighty, reigns over everything. So every creature is subordinate to God. Every ruler on this earth is subordinate to God. So God has complete and absolute reign. 
And he holds all creatures in his hand. It says the word of his power sustains everything. So even the devil is sustained and allowed to go on in existence because God allows it. And every one of us are sustained. So even though the devil might have a lot of people under his thumb on his planet, it says he's blinded the eyes of some, well, a lot. He still is just a creature that if God willed it, would just disappear into oblivion. So by the word of his power, this all-powerful God, this sovereign ruler, who what he says, when he wants, where he wants, how he wants, that's who God is. If your God doesn't fall into those uh, descriptions, you're not following God. If your God can't do what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, why he wants, then you're following something else that isn't God. So it's holiness. So God is so holy, and we are so wretched. That's why God had to send a, a mediator. He had to send one in uh, to come and die on the cross in our place, because we couldn't meet that holy standard. So God took on flesh, the Son of God came in His holiness. And it says, to say that God is holy is to say that He is eternally separate and distinct from all of His creation. From anything in creation, God is distinct and separate from. Completely holy. His perfection, and his, uh, it can't be added to. You can't detract, detract from His perfection, you can't add to His perfection. He cannot be any more holy and perfect and pure than he is. So he's all powerful. That's what the angels were saying. God, the Almighty, the one who has all power. So if you're going to plug in to a power source, don't you want the one who is all powerful? So that's the God you want to follow. Not a God of limitations. Not a God of, uh, well, if you dot this I and cross this T, that I might consider bringing you into my fold. But the God who says, come as you are. Bring all that to you. I will help take care of it. God has all power. He can exercise dominion over the entire universe. Carry out the purpose of his wisdom. Govern the hearts of men and women. And even create things out of nothing. Some of the slides got clipped off. I was talking to Pete the other day. Now just imagine. Just, this makes your brain kind of smoke a little bit. Just in this room here, we all got different facets. Take Lori, right? She's got different things going on in her family, in her life, in her daily walk, okay? But we pray to God. And God works all things together according to the good for those who are called according to his spirit. So she's got all this going on. And Chris has all this stuff going on, right? Now just in this small room, he's working, pinpointing everything that you need, Julie, in your life. And he's working it together in all them facets. Just think how mind-blowing it is that God's got all that going on just in this congregation at one time. Then think about the world. And he's got it all. And think about this. He all, has all that power and he cares personally for us at an individual level. That is a plan. That is, would you rather design your own plan? Or would you rather have somebody design your plan for you, Kate? Someone that knows more than you. There's only one person. You know a lot about, what's that? I mean, God. Because you can say, Mom, I want you to plan my life for me. And your mom knows you probably better than anybody. She's shaking her head. And you know yourself better than anybody. Your mom maybe second. But God knows you more than both of you combined. God knows you perfectly. So when you want to trust your future to somebody who knows the future and knows you, and knows exactly how he wants to use you in his kingdom and plug you in. Man, he wants that for everybody on an individual level. But he needs you to come to him and surrender your life. Say, no more me for me, but me for you, Lord. That's what he wants. That, those are our servants. And look, we got to make sure we're not putting God in a box. When we say, well, I don't know if God has a plan or a purpose for me. You just put God in a box. You're limiting it. He has a plan and a purpose for everybody. And it's good works. It's things that are going to be treasures in heaven that has been foreordained before the earth was even created. So, all knowing. It took me a while to get that definition. But I got one, I got one hammered out for all knowing. Isn't that great that God knows all? That there's nothing that escapes his, his mind. 
There's nothing that escapes his intelligence. There's nothing God can learn. You know God can't learn anything? It's not because he's dumb that he can't learn. I have a hard time learning math. I don't understand it. It makes my brain hurt and it makes me storm off crying and kick it again. But nothing surprises God. There's nothing that you can add to his intelligence. There's nothing you can say, you know what? I didn't know that. Thank you. No one can teach him. Who can be God's counselor? So God knows all. So don't you want to give your life to a God that has your best interest at hand, that has all the power, that has never had anybody to do something for him that he couldn't do himself, that has been from everlasting and will be to everlasting, and that cares about you intimately? So read those here. Those are what people violate a lot of times and gets God into a box. Now, when you got to have God in the box, you're not allowing... Uh, him to do his job. You're not allowing him to be God, basically. When you violate the character of God and you say, well, God only forgives uh, people a couple times and then he, that's enough of his mercy and grace. His mercy is, is just a one time or two time thing. No, it says his mercy is renewed every day. His love, he says he is love. The character of God, that is an attribute of God that actually is part of his being. He love. That means he cares. That means he's going to do whatever it takes, move mountains. He'll, he'll send his one and only son to die in your place. That's how much he loves you. The attributes of God, you can't violate those. The divine prerogatives of God, his sovereignty, he does what he wants to do, when he wants to, why he wants to. We can't question him as just mere creatures. So, here's some of the things that you'll run into. Now, I talked about fried chicken before, right? You guys remember the new fried chicken? A couple months ago, Rachel and I were driving home from a wedding, and Cracker Barrel had a billboard that advertised new fried chicken. And I was like, wait a second. Fried chicken's been around forever, and it's been on their menu forever. You can't have new fried chicken. Uh, Lori, what came first? Uh, the chicken, the egg, or the 20-piece bucket? Okay, that's an enigma right there. Oh. You don't have to answer that. But chicken's been around forever. And this Word of God is eternal. And it is not going to be changed. And people are going to say, well, there's new fried chicken. Maybe there's a new gospel out there. Maybe that's outdated, that Bible, and it doesn't fit into today. Yeah, I understand the Bible said that and that, but that doesn't really apply in the 21st century. No, that is new fried chicken. That is what Paul called another gospel. This is important that you have the proper perspective of Scripture if you're going to have a proper perspective of God, because this is His Word. And Jesus is the thread that runs through this Bible from Genesis to Revelation is Jesus. And what it says is true, and this is living, and this is soul food. And this doesn't change, and God doesn't change. So you need to be in this if you're going to have the proper perspective of God and live out his purpose in the world. So when people say, and I hear it all the time, well, that's outdated. I mean, they said that 2,000 years ago. How could they think in this internet age uh, of social media that uh, that could still be the same? Because God didn't know that there was more than two genders back then. Really? That God didn't know. I was, yeah. He's all knowing. He knows there's two genders. He made them. Genesis 1 through 11. So I actually heard of a uh, Christian philosopher uh, and theologian talking about, well, if Genesis 1, one uh, chapters 1 through 11 doesn't necessarily need to be taken literally. It's not, you know, was there really two trees in the Garden of Eden, these mystical trees, one of life and one of death? Was there really a snake that walked on two feet that God cursed? Was there really a burning bush in Exodus? Was it really a flood that covered the whole world? And he goes and talks about, what about polar bears? How did God get polar bears on the ark? Listen, if God wants there to be two trees in the Garden of Eden, he's going to do that. If one's going to be the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and one's going to be the tree of life, he can do that. Don't put God in a box and say, this can't be taken literally. If God wants to create a worldwide flood and get polar bears there, guess what's going to happen? Polar bears are going to get there. Whether he uh, teleports them or he sends eagles and albatrosses to fly the polar bears over, he's going to get them what he wants done. 
That's God. So don't put him in a box and say, well, he can't do this, he can't. No, you're violating his divine prerogative. You're violating his character and his attributes. And he got the Red Sea, the burning bush, the walls of Jericho. I've seen these TV shows. Nova, it's really bad at this. Where they go, the burning bush that Moses said, wait a second, there's a bush burning over here that's not being consumed. And it's talking, I'm going to go check it out. So Moses goes to the burning bush which God spoke out of to him. They say the burning bush was a natural gas leak. That what was causing the flame to come up. There was a natural gas leak and the flame, would, and that's why the flame, and those kind of trees, they can burn and they don't really get consumed. So we can put uh, actual history here and what really happened was what the Bible said. It's like, are you kidding me? If God wants to have a bush that doesn't burn up, he had three kids in a fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't burn up. That wasn't a natural gas leak. That was a fiery furnace fired up seven times greater. If God wants to do it, he's going to do it. The walls of Jericho, they actually took shofar horns. You know, the big, long, burr, burr, and uh, that sounded like a, a dying chicken. <laughs> Uh, they took the shofar <laughs> horn and they said, okay, one shofar horn does this many decibels. If you blow it this hard, and we'll say there's a million Israelis walking around, and if they all blew their shofar horn at the same time, that would create this much decibels, and the walls of Jericho are made out of this kind of compound and this and that. And they're actually saying, there would have been enough decibels to knock that down. They say, wait a second. If God wants to bring the walls of Jericho down, he's going to bring them down. That's what he's, that's his prerogative. You don't matter if he had one shofar or if he had a gazillion, he's going to bring him down. The, uh, the Red Sea, that's another thing. Well, the Red Sea was actually this wind anomaly that happened. But the winds were cutting across this way and that way. And it created the water effect that spread it. Okay? Why do these people want to deny the miracles of the Bible? Because if they accept the miracles of the Bible, they have to agree that it's supernatural, God-inspired, divinely written, and that there is an all-powerful, sovereign, almighty Lord and Savior of the world that they need to bow down to, and they don't want to bow down to Him. That's what it boils down to. So, then the prosperity gospel. And I've, I, I, I've, I've wrestled with this over and over again, because the Bible says a lot of times that Jesus, you know, He says, because of your faith, you've been healed. Because of your faith, go your way, you've been healed. Because of your faith, you've been healed. And there's a place in there where it says that he didn't do many healings because of their unbelief. And, and people will take these scriptures and say, look, it's Jesus' will. It's God's will to heal everybody all the time. It's God's will that everyone is healthy. It's God's will that everyone is wealthy. Okay? That's not what the Bible says. There's a man, he wrote a book called Fear Not. He just passed away last week of cancer. He was 77, uh, Jim Yosick. And he's a great man of God. And he had great faith. And his book was called Fear Not, When You're Going Through These Storms. But he understood, you might not come out of the storm. That sovereign God who reigns, it says Jesus Christ holds the keys of life and death. God says, who dies and when? He's sovereign. Nobody can die outside of God's will. Nobody can live outside of God's will. When we understand that, then we are worshiping the true God. Sometimes, ask the Apostle Paul. Paul, Paul what's wrong with your faith, brother? Because you're not getting healed. He has three times for that thorn in his flesh to be removed. God, please take this from me. Take this from me. God said, my grace is sufficient. Paul wasn't healed. Everybody that dies and doesn't come off their sick bed isn't healed. And you can't say it's because your faith wavered, or you weren't strong in your faith. Because that's what they'll say. If you don't get healed, your faith was lacking. That's their out. No. It's God's will that you die then. And you can't escape that. Look at Job. He said, though he slay me in him, I'll still trust him. Though God is actively engaged in killing me, he had such respect and, and, and perspective of God. that he says, even if God is actively engaged in killing me, I'm still going to trust him. What did he say when he lost all of his kids? And the, and, the, and, the, and the lightning came down, and the whirlwind, and destroyed all this stuff. He said, naked I came in this world, naked I'm going to go. Blessed be God. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. He understood God's sovereignty. Do you think God's more concerned about your comfort or about your care? He's more concerned about your comfort or your character. He's more concerned about your character. He doesn't care if you're comfortable. Do you think Jesus and his disciples were always comfortable? Do you think Jesus was comfortable on the cross? You don't think that was out of his comfort zone? Leaving the glories of heaven to come here be hunted and, and, and killed? God cares about our health but our spiritual health. And he cares about those who are spiritually sick with sin and do not have their, their sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus. He's concerned about our spiritual wealth. That's the treasure he's stored in heaven. That's the giving back into the community. That's the going to those who are the least, the orphans and widows. That's the spiritual riches that we have in Christ Jesus. We're plugged into heaven right now. If you have Christ in your heart, spiritual, uh, all the blessings of, of heaven are in Christ Jesus, are in you and accessible to you. The, the, those you give water to, and the prisoners you visit, and the mouths you feed, and the hungry, and the thirsty. Jesus says, when you do this to these, you are doing that to me. That's the treasure in heaven. That's the spiritual wealthiness that he wants you to have. That's the spiritual health that he wants you to have. Not monetary. Not physical health. Those are all good. And he will bless you with those if he decides to. But it's not going to be so you can uh, have a 20 car garage and fill it to the brim. It's so you can be a blessing to others. Amen. We're going to end on that amen, okay? Amen. <laughs> So as the band comes up, Madeline, can you come here? I need you to destroy this because we're taking God, we've taken God out of this box. We're not going to put him back in this box. So I want you to, I want you to jump on this and destroy this box. So we can't put God back in the box. Yeah, now he, we can still get in there, but he can get out. Now I've got the wall shit. That's how high you can. Thank you. All right, don't put him in a box. Keep him on his throne where he reigns. Amen? Amen. All right, get on up.
everybody.